A Philadelphia-based artist, Betty Lee Craft primarily works with textiles and mixed media in her day-to-day -day practice. She enjoys creating artworks that blend various techniques and is inspired by the cultural and artistic traditions from Africa and the Africa diaspora. She was the 2022 recipient of the Joyce de Guatemala Scholarship for BIPOC Women from Brandywine Workshop and Archives. This residency opportunity enabled her to create a print edition which honors the legacy of her father. We sat down with Betty for our monthly series, Artists in Conversation, to listen as she shared some of her inspirations behind her print and to learn more about her artistic trajectory. Thank you for coming, Betty. Thank you for coming to Artists in Conversation. Thank you for having me. Yes. I know it was an exciting day today because we got a chance um, to uh, sign the prints that you just completed, this yes. one particularly. Yes. And, um, but before we begin uh, anything, just you know, tell us a little bit about yourself. Tell us a little bit about who you are uh, and, and who is uh, Betty Lee Craft. <laughs> okay, well, first of all, thank you for you know, all of the um, guidance and the experience of, of having a print made. It's my very first and hopefully won't be my last, even though it may be someplace other than Brandywine. <laughs> right. But um, my name is Betty Lee Craft, mm -hmm. and I am, I say that I am African American of Guyanese descent mm -hmm. on my mother's side through my, my maternal grandfather. Mm -hmm. I have lived in West Philadelphia for most of my life until maybe 2016 when I was living and am still living in North Philadelphia. Um, so I like to call myself an indigenous West Philadelphian because that's where I spent most of my time. I consider myself a fiber mixed media artist mm -hmm. um, crossing lots of boundaries mm -hmm. in terms of technique mm -hmm. uh, because the range of my work goes from wearable art to wall hung exhibition work mm -hmm. and installation and um, sculpture in a soft form as that which can be made uh, with by using fabric. And um, can you tell me a little bit about like how did you learn to do these techniques? How, what was your, your training? Did you go to art school or how, what was your, 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 how did you <coughs> learn to be an artist? Okay, I would have to say uh, my maternal grandmother mm -hmm. introduced me to making and her mother had been a professional dressmaker in Vance County um, in Henderson, North Carolina. So she grew up with someone who made their living uh, with their hands. And her father had been a cane and rush weaver, mm -hmm. and he was a barber, who I understand from my mother made the lotions that he would put on the men's faces. Right. So uh, my grandmother taught me to sew on the machine, but first by hand. So the hand sewing came through her making all kinds of things, watching her make things, right. uh, braided rugs, using stockings, right? Mm -hmm. And she would sew them together and make these over rug, and it was at the foot of, of the bed. So when you got out, you know, you didn't get out on a cold floor. But I would say all of the things that um, I saw her making were basically out of necessity. You know, jumpers for myself and um, my first cousin, my sister. I still remember what they look like. Uh, the machine that I first ever sewed on was an old white rotary machine that was in her house. So I, I would say my art career and journey started with my maternal grandmother. And um, I used to make all my own clothes through school, even into um, my young adult years. 
So sewing was my medium. Mm -hmm. But I realized I wanted to be able to create clothing that was not like everything you saw in the store. And I thought I was going to be a fashion designer mm -hmm. and did go along that path. But when um, my father said that he really didn't, you know, have that level of money to send me to that kind of design school. Right. Then I just started doing it on my own. So a lot of my journey has been self-motivated mm -hmm. and um, putting myself in environments that would support my creative leanings. In the boutique era, which would be 60s, 70s, I would go to different places with um, garments that I had made that I thought looked particularly well done. Was, was there a point where you realized that you were crossing over or maybe I don't know if there was a point but when you were like I feel like I'm an artist I feel like I've crossed that bridge from just doing you know maybe the the sewing for more like, wearable um, mm -hmm more functional, I guess I would say. Right. Was there like a point where you started, uh, d where you recognize the crossover? Yeah, mm -hmm. and I would say that maybe um, it was kind of pre-1980 when I started working for the Fabric Workshop in 80 to 86. And this is the Fabric Workshop in Philadelphia, correct? Right, mm -hmm. right. It was called the Fabric Workshop then. It's now the Fabric Workshop and Museum. Right. So um, I had joined an organization uh, called NCA, National Conference of Artists, which was one of the largest organizations nationally for black artists. And most of them were fine artists, but there were people that did other things too. And also a member of a group here called NAFAD, National Association of Fashion and Accessory Designers, which was a, a national black organization. Mm -hmm. So I started finding myself um, doing wearable art because they, they had these fabulous runway shows once a year. Mm -hmm. And so that's when I started to see myself making a shift because I was doing custom clothing mm -hmm for private individuals and, oddly enough, some um, musicians who were performing and recording artists mm -hmm. that I did clothing for. So the shift was coming, but I didn't really get it until later on. So once I got to the fabric workshop, because uh, in between the last time I made clothing in that way and the fabric workshop, there was a four year period where I was a caregiver for my maternal grandmother. Mm -hmm. And so that brought us close again, like when I was young. So once I started at the fabric workshop, um, that was another world because I was interested, of course, in textile design because I worked with fabric. Right. And I said, well, here's a place that they actually print it. Mm -hmm. And I took some stuff of mine you know, asked them did they need help. And they saw my stuff and they were like, well, yeah, because I think the other person had left. Mm -hmm. And once I started there, wearable art and exhibit work mm -hmm. became a clearer focus because everyone that was coming through there was an in invited artist who stepped out of their medium, whatever it was, mm -hmm to experiment with textile design. So once those fabrics were finished, it was my job to engineer whatever it was the artists wanted out of their fabric. And that could go the gamut from napkins, something as simple as a napkin, to a sculptural something, right. or a huge thing for an installation. You know, it tested my abilities and stretched them. Right. So whatever I knew how to do, as an advanced uh, person who, who did sewing, I was able to bring all those skills to that job and even really kind of invent how to get some things done because um, it was a large experimental laboratory mm -hmm. and whatever they wanted that was within my capacity um, and so I got that, it so, done. So that basically sounds like uh, it set you off into a path 
to do even just art on your own afterwards. Yeah, afterwards. because being at the Fabric Workshop exposed me to textile printing on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. Even though I couldn't take part in it because my duties were enough right. that I, I saw the process. Mm -hmm. I learned more about hand dyeing mm -hmm. uh, there because there were all kinds of mm -hmm. things happening and all kinds of artists especially if you have someone like Yoshiko Wada, who's a um, Japanese textile specialist, right. especially in indigo dyeing. So that was my first exposure to an indigo dye vat, wow. things like that. That's amazing. So, so talk about a little bit more about your recent work then. So what are, your, um, what are some of the things that you're, you create? Uh, uh, talk a little bit about uh, maybe some of the recent not beyond the print that you just completed, like uh, uh, some of the stuff that you're, you're, you've been entertained okay. with. Basically. Well, I guess the thing that mm -hmm. really started me in terms of exhibition work mm -hmm. was um, me going to Brazil in 1988 with National Conference of Artists for an artist conference mm -hmm. that brought together Afro-Brazilian and African-American artists. Right. And I made a doll that was juried in by the late great John Biggers. Oh, interesting. Right? So I was like stunned. So I'm like, the doll is going. I hadn't thought about going, but when I found out I had a piece juried in, you know, I, you know, scared up the money <laughs> to be able to go. And I had done a lot of research about uh, Afro Brazilian culture and learned enough language to be able to get along, even though I probably sound like a baby talking <laughs> to them. But um, I did a lot of homework right. on Afro-Brazilian culture, so I went knowledgeable, and I knew what I was looking at. And after I came back from there, that was when I made the decision to do strictly wall home work using fabric, knowing that quilt making had existed in the family. I saw it as a way to revive that mm -hmm. and pay honor uh, to the women who had done that kind of uh, art making before me, even though they might not have called it art making. I am. Mm -hmm. so, so what are some of the things that um, inspire you to create some of the work? Uh, what are some of the subjects that you're interested in? Was, is it the materials? What are some of the things that you like yeah. to explore through, well, through your course, practice? Well, of course, you know, fabric, yeah. but mm -hmm. as a result of the fabric workshop and other exposures, I began to do more of my own surface design mm -hmm. through hand dyeing, hand painting, mm -hmm. and whatever else I could experiment with. Mm -hmm. And I was always a culture-oriented person particularly African culture and the um, artistry, whether it is dealing with spiritual mm -hmm. subject matter or other subject matter. And world culture in terms of textile mm -hmm. design and applications such as weaving, applique, I was interested in all of it and I exposed myself to as much of it as possible because I was very self-motivated mm -hmm. in that way and had always been about finding the knowledge wherever it was mm -hmm. and also taking uh, workshops with indigenous artists that mm -hmm. wherever they were and I could get there, whether it was Washington, whether it was New York or if they came here. But it was important to me to have um, interaction with indigenous African artists and those from the African diaspora uh, that had some technique I was interested in, such as learning how to do what is called the, the technical, or I'll say the cultural name, uh, Bogolan Fini, mm -hmm. which is the name for mud cloth. So mud cloth, if, to me, if it's real mud cloth, it's made in Mali mm -hmm. because a lot of other countries are doing their version of it. Mm -hmm. But to me, to have authentic mud cloth, it must come from Mali. Mm -hmm. And I do have two pieces that I bought many years ago because I knew they came from Mali. 
So, you know, if I'm taking a class, which I did with a, a Ugandan, um, a Kente Weaver from Baltimore, living in Baltimore, but I took two of his workshops. I was trying to expose myself on any level possible, especially to be able to talk intel intelligently about what might have influenced a particular thing that I'm making. Right. No, I think that's one of the, the beauties of living in this country sometimes is that there are people from all over the world and that even you can find the niche interest and you can talk to the people. So then when you're, you actually visit the country or you visit the place, mm -hmm. you, you can know and really appreciate it differently, yeah. right? Because the thing about mm -hmm. that is I, I, my mode of traveling is mm -hmm. to do homework as much homework about where you're going as possible and to learn to say, if it's a place that doesn't speak English, at least hello, thank you, goodbye, you're very nice, and um, the necessary, I need to go to the bathroom now. Right. <laughs> you know, I don't eat meat because yes. I'm a vegetarian. So you go mm. to Brazil, that's a very meat eating oh, place. Yes. Yes, and I yes. had to be able to say it. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, I believe in doing homework. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. Um, so let's shift a little bit uh, more to, towards a little bit about Brandywine. And mm -hmm. when, when did uh, Brandywine come to your radar in terms of, um, was it through exhibits mm -hmm. or just like what it, what's kind of your, your... I guess I kind of always mm -hmm. known mm -hmm. that Brandywine existed. Mm -hmm. And um, when James Dupre worked here, mm -hmm. You know, and because he had been a member of um, National Conference of Artists in those way long ago years, and I always admired him as an artist, had great respect for his abilities. And um, I know he was doing something here. Printmaking was not on my radar, mm -hmm. right? But and you were doing printmaking in, in, in the fabric workshop, though, right? Yeah, but see, this predates even that. Oh, really? So this would have okay. been early, earlier, late 70s or whatever mm -hmm. it was he was here. And he said something to me like, right. well, you ought to come. Mm -hmm. And I had not seen myself. I figured that, you know, Brandywine was for people that had international and national reputations. And I just didn't, you know, I didn't feel that that was something, um, you know, that was for me. Mm -hmm. Now, if I knew what I knew now, mm -hmm. it would be a different story. Right. But I always knew what happened here. Mm -hmm. I had not been here to actually see it. Oh, interesting. Yeah. See those processes. Mm -hmm. that's, that's interesting. And, uh, and now you're here. Uh, yeah. Now you're here. You're part of the, the, the Brandywine family. Uh, you earned the Joyce the Guatemala BIPOC uh, scholarship. And, um, you know, we're really happy that you were accepted in and that you were able to yeah. work with us and, and Leslie to produce this wonderful print. Thank um, you. Can you uh, talk a little bit about your experience, uh, even just coming up with the print or, or just okay. in general, like what, what was that like for you? I was thinking about, okay, what am I gonna do? Mm -hmm. You know, what, what subject matter or content am I gonna entertain? Mm -hmm. And my dad's picture, which is here, was something I had always wanted to do. Mm -hmm. um, a creative something with it, but wasn't sure. And I was like, Dad's photo. And then I realized I had the Army Discharge papers. I said, this is a way for me to do something that honors him. Mm -hmm. Because I have a small body of work that honors the maternal side of the family, because mm -hmm. they're called matrilineal praise songs mm -hmm. with whatever other title I put in front of that. So I saw it as an opportunity to uh, honor my father, who was a World War II vet, which all of the campaigns he was in are actually on this um, Army Discharge document. And it was uh, also a way for me to honor his career as a lifelong printer for the government. Mm -hmm. at, and and you, um, you were saying earlier, though, that uh, you 
didn't know that he was an uh, a vet and that he, uh, you saw the discharge papers, is that correct? Or? I knew that he mm -hmm. had been in the war. Mm -hmm. He never talked about it. And I knew that he was a veteran mm -hmm. because um, there were papers when I was in elementary mm -hmm. school that had to be signed, I think, one, once or twice a year. And those were for the, the, the um, children whose parents worked for the government. Right. So that was government worker. I don't know what the document was, but I knew, you know, I had to take it back signed mm -hmm. ever so often. Mm -hmm. So. Um, but then you, f you said you found the discharge, the, the paper. Yeah, themselves. I found mm -hmm. that paper after he passed, and I was going through those things that you must go through when mm -hmm. um, a loved one passes on. Mm -hmm. And since I was the person that was named as the executor, mm -hmm. you know, that was my duty to go through everything and do what you have to do. Mm -hmm. And when I saw that, I, I said, oh my goodness. I looked at all the campaigns he had been a part of. So all those documents, I gathered them together, put them in a thing and kept them where I always knew where they were going to be. Mm -hmm. Not knowing that the Brandy Mine moment, moment mm -hmm was going to appear. So I came upon these in 2007. Wow. Because that was the year he passed. Mm -hmm. So it's been a, a, a little, a few years now. Yeah. yeah. So I just mm -hmm. made sure I always knew where those older photos were from mm -hmm. the paternal side and the maternal side, because I saw them as potential content for new work mm -hmm. to honor ancestors. Mm -hmm. So that's basically what this is. is um, the first paternal praise song. Nice, nice. Number one. Nice. So, if, uh, so how would you describe it then? Like, how would you describe the print? Uh, is it uh, biographical? Is it just very fam um, Is it similar to other mm -hmm. stuff that you've done? Um, well, it, it really kind of falls in line with um, a series that's ongoing that mm -hmm. honors ancestors mm -hmm. of mine and ancestors that may be extended family or even ancestors because I'm a, I love music, I love jazz. Right. And I had stretched it out into musical ancestors, even though they're not related to me. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's kind of taken a life of its own. When, when you look at this print, uh, can you tell us a little bit about some of the elements that make up the, the print itself? Uh, like, what are some of the things that people, you know, should pay attention to? And, okay. And I know you brought something with you. Yeah. Uh -huh. Well, I'll start with the background. Mm -hmm. All of the blues and um, that which you're looking at really are from... Uh, two items that I had hand dyed, and one of them I'm holding, which is a silk um, pocket square that I had dyed for my dad along with whatever else I gave him. But I gave him this so that, you know, when he went to church or wore a suit, he would have something that I had made. Mm -hmm. And so you can see some of the circular areas mm -hmm. right. there because most of the things that are, it's not a border, but mm -hmm. I'm calling it a border, mm -hmm. where these um, cultural symbols called Adinkra symbols mm -hmm. from Ghana, West Africa, all of them are on some cut that I made in the paper that I was doing the layout in mm -hmm. to put these symbols on because I felt that it was important for me to make that connection. Um, and I know that um, he may not have known about a dink for symbols, but he knew about Ghana. Right. And I saw a way to make, infuse a cultural connection. So there are other, uh, there's another scar where you see this horizontal light area. Mm -hmm. It's a, a section from a different scarf that's a personal one of mine because the one I'm wearing I had hand dyed quite some years ago. So it uh, was the suggestion of the master printer who was guiding me through all of this, Leslie Friedman. Mm -hmm. uh, she said, well, why don't you think about using some of your own fabric? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you're- As you're, an element. 
And yeah. I was like, yeah, mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. And um, there it is. Because the thing I was interested in is, okay, you can see kind of folded areas so that it kind of feels like a textile. And even in some areas, you can see the stitch marks right. that make the hem of this piece. And, and I wanted to have as much of that as possible and even this piece folded back. Mm -hmm. So nice. fabric as a background, when I found out that was a possibility, I was really happy. Mm -hmm. So the other thing, um, aside from dad's photo, because mm -hmm. the printer, Leslie, asked me if I wanted to have the writing. And I was like, yeah, because to me, that's like very important to have his handwriting there, mm -hmm. both on the photo and also having signed the Army Discharge document. And this piece here is actually what's written on the back of that photo, because the photo itself is no bigger than this. Mm -hmm. And so it says um, that it was made in Nancy, France, 1944, World War II, and that he was in the 75th Chemical Battalion uh, Regiment 39. Mm -hmm. And so what this is making me want to do is to go to those places that um, keep veterans' papers mm -hmm. so I can find out more about this battalion that he was in and what exactly what they did. Mm -hmm. So the other um, element which I decided to use was the only existing infant picture of me. Mm -hmm. And... Um, you know, it just, it just seemed the right thing to do. I'm honoring him, mm -hmm. and here I am. And somebody said, yeah, well, you have his eyes. I was like, well, there it is, you know. Uh, and I have cut edge mm -hmm. as well as a raw torn edge because I wanted to have, you know, both those kinds of um, design elements. Mm -hmm. It gave me a lot more respect for collage artists and what they do. Right. You know, how you tear the paper, how the white gets shown or not shown. So I must have torn about four of them before I could feel comfortable with it. Mm -hmm. uh, the last thing would be these symbols, which are called Adinkra symbols. So you can see the set here. There's one that repeats. I made sure that you know, they at least repeat it mm -hmm. uh, somewhere. And the symbols that um, I chose were those that I felt um, spoke to my dad's personality or positive traits for him as a man, as a parent. Right. Um, there's those that speak to bravery, mm -hmm. perseverance, uh, hardiness, steadfastness, wisdom, um, those things that, that make a person's value system maybe, because the Dinkra symbols are basically um, a language that speak to cultural and environmental and other kinds of things that make up a community. I, don't, I mean, there's a lot to be able to say about those symbols, but I'm not sure if you want to hear <laughs> the entire yeah. How thing. How much time do we have, right? Right. <laughs> the, um, yeah, because that's, <laughs> that's a whole lecture in and of itself. Right. Because also, to add, mm -hmm. each of these symbols has their own proverb. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Their own proverb. <clears throat> and um, this is the tip of the iceberg because there's at least 600 wow. of these symbols. Mm -hmm. And um, there is a dictionary, because I have the Adinkra dictionary, which is now out of print. Mm -hmm. And so I was glad to be able to infuse something from my own cultural interest in terms of African and African diasporan uh, cultural elements. But uh, Adinkra symbols <coughs> are from Ghana, West Africa, and they were formulated within the Akan people. Mm -hmm that 
ethnic group of Khan people who speak a language called Tri. Mm -hmm. It's spelled T-W-I, but it's pronounced Tri. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, when I began to learn about Adinkra symbols, it was long, long before now, because mm -hmm. my cultural homework started in the 60s with Black is Beautiful, you know, and it just continued. Mm -hmm. So it just felt um, appropriate to find the symbols that I felt mm -hmm. echoed qualities, positive qualities of my dad and use them in this piece mm -hmm. to honor his memory. Right. So how do you feel now that you've completed the, the, the print? Uh, like what was, what was the, like, what did you feel at the beginning when you look back and what do you feel now in comparison? Yeah, well, printmaking was never a medium I had explored mm -hmm. to this level. I had taken a class where you do a monoprint, you know, but I knew that coming to Brandywine was another level. Mm -hmm. So I was nervous. Mm -hmm. I was nervous and I, I was nervous because I wanted to do a good job, you know. I wanted to uh, go through this and come out with something that I could be proud of mm -hmm. and that Brandywine would be proud to have mm -hmm. in their collection. Mm -hmm. So I felt relief <laughs> when I found out it was finished mm -hmm. and over mm -hmm. and it was a great learning experience. You know, being with Leslie was really great because she uh, let me know some things so that I could hopefully have made the job easier for her. But some of the things that I didn't know that could happen, because I don't know how to do um, Photoshop. Right. Mm -hmm. And those techniques of um, like digital, digital techniques. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the yeah. digital world. You know, I'm, I'm putting my toes in there, but you know. Not there yet, right? <laughs> yeah, so these symbols, you know, when I first had, had cut them out, the white was still where you see the blue, mm -hmm. any of the open areas. And so I had told her that I wanted to have them erased, eliminated, because I said in real Adinkra cloth, the stamps are stamped on the cloth, so whatever is the color of the background shows through those open areas. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that was able to be done, which I was really very um, pleased with. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Um, now, I mean, this is a, a, a really lovely composition, and, and it looks like you guys did a really good job uh, putting things together. Um, now, it's been wonderful be being able to hear about the, the piece and, um, you know, can wait. I, yeah. I can't wait to see what you, else you create, either with this series uh, with your father and even in printmaking, because yeah. I'm, I'm sure that you have ideas already yeah, well, circulating. Yeah, see, I have a whole photo album mm -hmm. of his, and there are pictures back to when he was in school in um, St. Augustine College where he met my mother, mm -hmm. right? So there's a whole thing. And he had, I believe, wanted to be a photographer because mm -hmm. he took really great photos, but he didn't pursue it. Right. So some of the things that he photographed that I think were really beautiful pieces, I would like to be able to expose them to the world mm -hmm. in terms of maybe um, dye sublimation, having images on fabric, mm -hmm. and um, extending the paternal praise song with existing imagery that he actually photographed. Excellent. That sounds like a, 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 you have your hands full for the next couple of years uh, with this project. And yeah, well, I'm glad to have more than enough mm -hmm. than to have to scrape around for ideas. Right. So and thank you. Thank you so much for, for being here and, and, and doing the thing that you do because uh, okay. I'll it's keep all about you the posted. artwork. Yes. Thank you. All right. <laughs> mm -hmm.